Welcome to another episode of Social PR Secrets. My name is Lisa Beyer, and I'll be your host. My guest today is AJ Wilcox. I remember first meeting AJ at an SMX marketing conference a few years back. I was speaking on the panel talking about Social PR Secrets, and AJ came up and chatted with me after, and we compared notes on LinkedIn marketing. Since then, I have watched AJ's career grow, and I've watched him become a speaker at some very well-known conferences, including social media marketing world. Today, AJ owns his own agency specializing in LinkedIn, and that's what we're going to talk about, all the social PR secrets behind LinkedIn advertising and more. Welcome, AJ. Social PR secrets for LinkedIn. Hey, AJ, how are you? Oh, Lisa, I'm doing great. Thanks so much for having me on. Yeah, thanks for being part of this episode. And we're kind of in a really strange time. If you're listening to this podcast um, in real time or more in real time, you'll know, but hopefully we're past this if you're listening to it. And all of these steps will still be relevant. But um, I also want to focus on, you know, what's happening right now when it comes to LinkedIn and how we can leverage it for public relations from an organic and also a paid side. But before we get into that, AJ, tell us a little bit about your background, your journey, how you ended up um, where you are, and I'll let you go for it. Awesome. Well, I started out, uh, I've been a digital marketer for like 14 years now, really loved search engine optimization, uh, Google ads kind of early on. But about eight years ago, I fell in love with LinkedIn as a platform, and I especially fell in love with LinkedIn ads. At a previous employer, I took their account from nothing where on my very first day I'm talking to the CMO and uh, laying out my plans and she goes, okay, by the way, we just started a pilot with LinkedIn ads. So see what you can do with it. And I was taken aback because I'd never even heard of LinkedIn ads. I went from that to taking it to become LinkedIn's largest spending account worldwide. Um, and it, you know, along with that came all of the relationships I was able to build at LinkedIn, um, uh, all the insights I was able to gather. And so about five years ago, I broke off and started b2links.com. And we're an ad agency that specializes just in LinkedIn ads. So that's what I've been up to for about the last five years is just deeply embedded and, and uh, you know, servicing around LinkedIn. Yeah. And I think AJ, the first time I met you was at one of the maybe SMX conferences. Um, and I did a session on social PR secrets and maybe talked a little bit about LinkedIn. And that's where we originally met. And now we see each other at PubCon and Social Media Examiner. Um, so but now we're here talking about um, the different aspects of, of LinkedIn. And one of the things that I love is that you're very, you're so passionate about LinkedIn. And up until about a year ago, like LinkedIn, we kind of knew LinkedIn was like the place to be, but now LinkedIn is really the place to be. And there's a lot of opportunity. Um, AG and I also work together as partner agencies. So we work together on different clients. And just because I'm a public relations agency, the Bayer Group is a PR agency. We also do a lot of paid and digital marketing um, that has a public relations lens in mind. So AJ, I just want to start with the organic side of LinkedIn and talk to us a little bit about the algorithm and some of the things that you can actually accomplish in LinkedIn versus Facebook or Instagram. And there's not the organic opportunity in those. Yeah, th this is so interesting to me. I mean, first of all, we don't offer any services around the organic side. This is just me kind of geeking out. We absolutely love the fact that there just isn't another platform out there that will give you the, the free organic reach. Um, it, it's really not uncommon for me to publish something and get five to seven times more views on the post than I have followers. It is the easiest network in the whole world to go viral on. And I just, I can't believe that that is going at least to this point has been so underappreciated. And I, I'm seeing, I mean, just you and I, we, we knew the secrets early and I'm seeing a lot more people who are starting to flock to it, but the algorithm is very, very complimentary to people. Yeah, and uh, I mean, somebody's LinkedIn page for business, for example, um, a brand's LinkedIn page, you know, is, is really prime for all different types of content, especially if you're B2B. So what are you seeing um, as far as trends, just in general, it doesn't have to be just organic in LinkedIn. What are some things that are really working and what's appropriate and how can brands make the most out of LinkedIn today? Well, first of all, 
your company page, it's really hard to get the same level of organic reach from a company as it is from an individual. And we don't know if this is algorithmic, if LinkedIn's, uh, their algorithm is purposely saying, ooh, this comes from a company, they should be paying, let's suppress it. Um, or if it's just people like to deal with other people, they like to know that there's a real person on the other end of that conversation and not just a faceless organization. So whatever it is, if you publish something as a company, it's probably not gonna go very far, you know, really regardless of what it is. But if you can get your exec staff and your sales folks and uh, influencers within your organization to all be sharing in concert these things across their, or from their personal profiles, then you all, all of a sudden start getting this massive free reach that's incredible. So I, I think as a first trend, don't be isolated within your company. If you are running the company page, um, reach out to people across the, the whole organization and find ways of getting people to share and, and incorporate their content together because that's what's really working. Yeah, LinkedIn just came out with that feature. I think it's available to everybody now where you can actually invite team members to be notified when your page posts something so that they then can, you know, then share it with their with their audience. And one of the things I personally love about LinkedIn and when it comes to getting more reach and exposure is being able to republish and repurpose on the blog like articles on the personal side of the personal profiles of, of LinkedIn and then taking that and sharing it over to the LinkedIn company page. Um, I mean, I just think that that's brilliant. And that's just something that may or may not be available, you know, a year from now, like it is now. Yeah. And in order to get that kind of like syncing up of your team, you used to have to buy a product that LinkedIn had called Elevate. That It wasn't very expensive, but you know, it was a, it was a, an actual like outlay your company had to do and usually came from your social department. Um, they, they just announced this year that, uh, you know, they're going to stop selling Elevate and they're going to start baking the products in to just the free version of LinkedIn. So uh, all of the stuff that people before had to pay for, you're now go going to get the ability to just roll out internally and take advantage of for free. Awesome. So speaking of paid, what are some of your favorite um, ways to use LinkedIn from a paid standpoint and how can... How can it translate into helping companies get exposure and reach and visibility um, from a PR standpoint? And you don't have to keep it within PR, but what, what's, tell us what's working. Yeah. So the real value behind LinkedIn's ads, as many of you may already know, is the targeting. It's, you know, it's a very expensive network. The, the cost is much higher than pretty much every other traffic channel out there that I've seen, but the targeting is incredible. You can make sure that your ads are only being seen by the most influential people, uh, the most ideal prospects for you, the media. I mean, the control that you have over, over it is incredible. So as you're thinking about, you know, what is this message that I can show to the exact right people at this exact right time, uh, LinkedIn ads is going to be the right way to do it. Take advantage of their targeting around job title and department and industry, company size, uh, skills on their profile, groups, seniority. And that's probably only about a fifth or a sixth of everything that's available. If you want to reach anyone in business, LinkedIn ads is probably the right way to do it. Yeah. So I'll just share one of my, you know, one of the buyer group's favorite social PR secrets, but we do from a top of funnel standpoint. So we, we like to kind of combine top of funnel and bottom of funnel and LinkedIn bottom of funnel, like it depends on what the bottom of funnel, you know, what your type of conversion you're looking for. So we like to do this um, process that every week on a Monday, we're going to figure out what is our featured content of the week. And we pin that content to the top of our, our LinkedIn page. And then we hand that over to you guys, AJ, to then help us boost um, that content to the appropriate audience so that the content is getting exposure. And then we have each month, we have going different eBooks, um, primarily eBooks to get the down, to get the email address and get that lead for bottom of funnel. So that's how, in, you know, some of that content that we're pinning and post and promoting to the top of the feed. And that's not all we promote top of funnel, but we also like to promote uh, news, company news, so that our followers can, you know, can actually see what's happening in real time. And we're able to control it more with more of a paid push than just relying on the organic side of things. Yeah. And I think it's a brilliant strategy. Something else I'd add to it that 
we're going to be able to do probably in October of this year of 2020. Um, right now, if you sent traffic to a third party site, let's say you had a wall, uh, like a wall street journal write up or something and wanted to send people there, you'd be paying LinkedIn's prices to send traffic away where you couldn't then follow up with that traffic. And, you know, cause someone else, you know, the wall street journal owns that page. You don't. But in October, LinkedIn's going to be rolling out an advanced version of their current retargeting where you'll be able to say things like, I'm going to put this in an ad. I'm going to send people to the Wall Street Journal. And any LinkedIn member who clicks on that ad, I then want to add to this audience to follow up with another offer. Maybe it is a demo request. Maybe it's a further, you know, a white paper or something like that, but something to follow up. And I'm so excited for this functionality to come out because as in the PR world, that's going to give us a lot of credibility to be working with these, you know, third-party unbiased uh, you know, people who are praising. Yeah. yeah, that's amazing. And I mean, LinkedIn is a major tool when it comes to media relations and trying to build relationships with the media or identify the right journalist with the right publication. Um, so also being able to help that journalist out once that public, once that story comes out to help that journalist get the exposure. I mean, the Wall Street Journal, you know, whatever the outlet is, they don't really need the exposure, but the journalist who wrote the story is, you know, they're all trying to get, you know, that it matters to them. It matters like how well their stories do. So if you're putting paid behind, um, you know, a story for your, for your brand, that journalist who the writer is also going to be getting the benefits and the exposure. And we always like to give shout outs to the writers when, whenever we share anything that has any write-ups for our clients, just to make sure that they're getting that, that um, bit of attention too. Oh, that's brilliant. And certainly Wall Street Journal, bad example. They get plenty, plenty of credibility. Well, yeah, you know. <laughs> but, but you send to any anyone, especially yeah. if you're putting like, like LinkedIn paid, you are sending the exact right people to that, that article who are going to care. I, I bet the person who wrote is just going to be so excited to know that they've got, you know, just VPs and above from large companies who are seeing that or, you know, whatever your target is. Yeah. Yeah. And um, so I want to also just kind of talk about some of the things that, that you're doing. So I know that you just launched a podcast. Do you want to talk a little bit about? Yeah, it's called the LinkedIn ads show. I, for the longest time, I batted around the idea of doing a podcast and thought, oh, LinkedIn ads, it's too narrow of a topic. Um, but eventually I decided to kind of take the dive for it. So as of today, uh, there are seven episodes out. Um, they come out every Tuesday morning. And so anyone who wants to dive really deep into the world of LinkedIn ads, come join me. Um, certainly it's, it's pretty geeky, but I'm, I'm having a great time doing it. What were some of your recent topics? Uh, I had two interviews with LinkedIn's heads of product. Um, Ooh, I like that. Yeah, I had them come on to like describe how they are viewing their products and what their roadmap plans look like. That was really cool. I had one all about bidding and budgeting, how to get the best costs on LinkedIn, one about targeting strategy. Uh, the one that drops tomorrow is going to be all about um, the differences between Facebook ads and LinkedIn ads and you know which are better in certain cases. So lots of good topics and I don't have any shortage of ideas yet. So uh, feel free to tune in. Yeah. And um, so a lot of the conferences that we were all going to be speaking at have now um, been canceled because of coronavirus, which is really sad. But I think everybody's reinventing and doing things like podcasts or online summits and, and things like that. So, um, you know, speaking of events in general. So one of the things that I saw that came recently to LinkedIn was events that you're able to create like a, similar to Facebook, create an event. Can you promote those events through LinkedIn ads? Not yet, but I'm super excited for when we can. Uh, they were asking for my feedback really early on. And I just said, events are a fantastic idea. I love Facebook's events and how they have an ad format. Just please, please, please let it be a, a paid or organic uh, or an in-person or a digital version of events. Um, so that they can be really versatile and we can use them for everything. So uh, at least not yet from the ad side, but I know that there's at least plans to do so. And I'm hoping the sooner the better. Right. And then when we talk about events, the events can be online events. If they don't have to be a, an actual event that you're um, using LinkedIn to get the word out about. So I think that that is, um, it's super exciting to see that that's coming. Are there any other new things coming out that we should know about? You can give us a heads up that, maybe we haven't talked about that brands should be taking advantage of? Yeah, right now there's a, a new ad format that LinkedIn 
has released to about 50% of people. So most likely by the time you hear this, this will be available to everyone, but it's called conversation ads. And it shows up in your, your messaging, your LinkedIn uh, in mail as a, a promoted message, but it's, it's like a chat bot. It, it'll ask you a question and you answer the question. And depending on how you answer, it can give you access to two different offers. So imagine something like, Hey, are you going to be at this event? And if they answer yes, you go, cool, we'd love to offer you something uh, if you come by our booth and we'd love to do a, an in-person meetup. And if they say no, then you can say, well, hey, how about you join us for this webinar where we're going to teach you something? And they've had this ad format for a while that they call message ads or sponsored in-mail, but it was so stiff. It was like, here is a cold message you get. And if it doesn't work for you, you just ignore it. But now you've got multiple shots on goal, essentially. Uh, with these conversation ads and it's the same inventory it's the same cost it's just more versatile so i'm really excited about that ad format to be uh fully rolled out by the end of like this week i think cool yeah that's awesome and so i know one of the other um ways to really get more exposure is to use video on linkedin whether it's organic or paid the video is working really well. So do you have any tips on using video and maybe some, some things that are big fails or things that are super um, easy to do and just nobody knows to do it yet? Oh, I'm so good at big fails. Uh, <laughs> what I have found is uh, over some hard fought usage of LinkedIn's video ads is number one, they're pretty expensive. I mean, you compare it against like Facebook or YouTube video ads, they're probably five to 10 times the cost that it's the price that we pay for LinkedIn's targeting. Um, but very much similar functionality to Facebook where you, um, it's going to auto play, but it's going to play as muted. So it's super, super important to have your first uh, frame, your first couple of seconds of the video to have action, to capture them, to make it worth watching. And then realizing that 80% of the people aren't going to watch with sound on. So your subtitles are super, super valuable. Um, so those are the, the two biggest things I'd say is make sure your video is shortened to the point. Uh, it provides a lot of movement right up front and has the subtitles so that people will want to pay attention. And, um, and then like we talked about a little bit earlier on this advanced retargeting that LinkedIn's coming out with slated for October, it's going to work really well for video ads. We'll be able to say something like if you watched 50% of my first video, now I want to show you the second one in the sequence. And you know, this is all just going to make LinkedIn's video ads even more powerful. Yeah, totally. So a couple other things that, that um, brands that I see that when working brands, you have to continue to remind or, or correct is um, front loading the captions because they get truncated when they go to mobile. And like a lot of times brands are writing their captions not with from a desktop without thinking mobile in mind. So, you know, the first however many characters are, that's all that's going to show up. So do you have any tips with that in mind of this captions and um, when you're creating a post, let's say that's gonna be promoted, um, any tips beyond that? Uh, yeah, I think the best tip I can give, and by the way, that's, that's a brilliant insight you just came up with. I hadn't even really considered it before now. Um, I would just say, burn your captions in, have your video editor actually put the captions on screen so that you're not dealing with a .srt file and then you don't have to worry about uh, you know, different devices reading them separately. Um, just burn them in and take that all away from Facebook and LinkedIn's hands. And what about it for non-video type of captions? So if you're just, um, it's, let's just say, so let's specifically talk about, um, I heard you talking, I think it was this weekend or last week, just about LinkedIn's algorithm and link posts for, specifically and how, link posts are getting, um, you know, they're not getting the exposure because LinkedIn doesn't want to take somebody off LinkedIn. Same thing with Facebook, you know, which has been going on for a couple of years. But so what are some workarounds with that? What's some advice that you can give for link posts when you want to promote, not promote, but even just like share different types of articles from different publications? Yeah, you bring up a super good point. And this is something that all of us are super sad about when we go to share something that we found to be a valuable resource. As soon as we link out, LinkedIn's algorithm just chops the legs off of it and it just doesn't go anywhere. Uh, if I share yeah. a post that has you know, no link out, it's just maybe text only, uh, it's, it'll probably go significantly viral. And if I share something with a link, it immediately gets, you know, maybe it's like 20% of my followers will even have a chance to see it. So 
because of that, we, we use a lot of workarounds. Um, the one that you've probably seen really commonly is link in the first comment. So you post it as text only or, or just image or video, and then you go and comment yourself as the first comment and say, here's the link. It's a little bit tough because as more and more people engage, it pushes that comment down. And yeah, it it's very confusing. Link. Yeah, you don't really, um, you know, sometimes people never even see that link. They just see it as, as the image and then it's like, where is the article? Where do I click yes. through? Yeah, uh, another workaround I've seen people do, um, this one's not quite my favorite. The next one I tell you about will be my favorite. Uh, mm -hmm. but this one is you publish the post as text only or image or video, and then you go and edit the post later to paste the link in. It likely won't turn it into a link, but someone can still copy and paste and uh, if, if they know what they're doing and still get yeah. there. Um, and that doesn't seem to affect the algorithm as adversely, uh, but I think there's still an effect there. I think LinkedIn still knows that there's a link. So basically LinkedIn doesn't like, even if it's not a link post, if you just do it as an image post, but then put the hyperlink in the caption, you get penalized with that also? Yeah, probably not quite as bad, but I, I definitely don't see my posts perform well that have a link in them at all. Um, yeah. But, but the thing that I've found to perform the very best, and this is this is a lot of hard work, uh, and you, you'll know as we go through this <laughs> why, um, but instead of linking someone to something, you put out a post that says, here's what I'm offering, comment below if you're interested. And then what happens is, you know, on LinkedIn's algorithm, they know when someone is commenting that there's valuable conversation going on. So they really promote things that are getting commented on. So by saying comment below, if you're interested, you're getting a lot of people commenting. So LinkedIn goes, ooh, there's hot conversation here. I'm gonna keep promoting this. And so they, they let it go viral. And then your job as the marketer is to go through every single one of those people reach out to them manually, and this is probably great work for a VA, but reach out to them to connect with them and then send them the link, give them what you told them you were going to give them. And then you get the virality, you get new connections, and uh, you know, your, your message actually got out there to a lot of people. So I, I'm a big fan of that, even though it's a ton of work. Yeah, yeah, no, but that is, I mean, you know, sometimes you have to do that to get the, the quality leads, right? Oh yeah. Yep, we do what we got to do. <laughs> so what about LinkedIn groups? Are you part of any? Do you have any tips when it comes to LinkedIn groups? I mean, they were at one time like very, very popular. I'm a member of a bunch of groups. I'm not that, honestly, I'm not that active, um, but I do appreciate <clears throat> when you get the notification that an admin has suggested this piece of content from a group. So what are what is your take on groups and what are you doing in them, if anything? Yeah, I'm a member of probably 10 groups. And there are only two that have real authentic conversation happening inside of them right now. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, it's really sad. Um, my recommendation is yes, groups can be very powerful, but uh, it means you've got to sift through some crap. You've got to go and join a bunch of groups and see, oh, this one's a, a link dumping ground. This one's been taken over by spam. Uh, there's nothing real here happening and leave them until you find those few golden gems of the groups that there is stuff going on in. Yep. Once you've found that, just go and start authentic conversations. Go and seek to help people and share what you know, and don't just turn it into a link dumping ground because you can tell by looking back that zero of them have comments. That's what people think of when you dump a link with no context. Makes sense, makes sense. So I'm gonna go a little bit off topic of LinkedIn just to go circle back to your podcast that you just started. So I, um, I was at PodFest a couple weeks ago mm -hmm. and it was awesome. So. If, Go, just go buy your ticket for the next one. But um, I would love to know, So, you, since you just started your podcast, do you have any tips for maybe people that are brands that are trying to start a podcast? Like, is there certain equipment that you, somebody said, oh, you have to get this or something that you did or the hosting platform? Like if there's just one or two tips, just since you just went through the process and I'm taking my brands, my, my clients and also um, some of my brands through the process too. So, you know, just curious of what you, what you have found in your in your journey of podcasting. Yeah, I have had so much help from people uh, who are mentors to me, who've given me such good advice. Uh, when I was very first considering launching the podcast, I talked to Michael Stelzner, who, who runs the Social Media Examiner podcast in the social media marketing world. And he told me, he's like, ooh, you've got to talk to this production company who does all of our editing. 
And so I talked to them and ended up using them for all of my editing. And I bought their consulting hours to say, okay, here's what the ambiance of my room sounds like, you know, help me get the best equipment. And so they kind of walked me through there's uh, on the lower end, there's a microphone uh, called the ATR 2100 by Audio Technica. It's like 120 bucks and it sounds really good for, for cheaper equipment. And then the one that I'm on is it's called the Shure SM7B and it's probably around 300 bucks. And they basically said like, if you want your content to sound really good and you're okay paying up for it, that's the one you get. Um, so I, I've liked that. Um, both of the microphones go into a mixer that totally overwhelms me. Lots of knobs and things, uh, knobs and buttons, but um, you know, I, I figured out what they all do and they go through a processor so that right now you guys can't hear that I have an air conditioner blazing in the room because I work on a treadmill desk and I purposely wanted to be able to take out background noise. Plus behind this wall right here at any given time, one of my four kids might be running down the hall screaming. So uh, that was the okay, way I did it. <laughs> yeah. 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 That sounds awesome. I, um, I'll post it. I don't think if I, if I can grab it. So I thought this was brilliant. One, one tip for podcasting, just from, from a PR standpoint, let me see if I can grab this and show you the name of the company. Yeah, you can hear my leaf blower too. Hopefully I'll be able to get uh, that background noise. <laughs> um, okay, so this is really cool. So this company is called uh, Versa Mic Labs. So you can, can you see it? So you buy like yeah. a branded thing that's going to go on your, you could put it on your, on, on, like I could put it on mine. Cool. So that when you're doing any type of video, it's like the brand, it's like, you know, like you're the radio station. Oh, that's cool. I like that. Yeah. Definitely so I'll send that. you this. Yeah. <laughs> So another really cool resource that I'll point out, um, there's a company called Crisp, K-R-I-S-P. And okay. I mean, if you've gone the full, like you have a processor route to take out background noise, that's, you know, that's one thing. But Crisp, uh, it's, it's AI technology that's constantly listening to your audio stream and it's actively editing out background noise. Uh, and I think they have a freemium plan or something. I, I got the... Um, the paid plan when it was still new and got grandfathered in, but you can, if you go with a cheaper mic, um, you can literally like hold the mic up to uh, like a go-kart or something on an engine and it'll actively take it out for you. Um, so yeah, I, I would recommend that's a really cool one. If people are in a noisy environment and just want to make sure their audio sounds good. Yeah. I mean, then, you know, we've gotten to the point where it's, I mean, Sometimes like when you're doing a podcast interview, you can't control the person on the other side. So people are, seem more forgiving than let's just say a year ago, even when, when podcasting was popular a year ago, but you know, now it's like, there's a lot of podcast brands that are starting their own podcast and then they're being guests, guesting on podcasts and, you know, not everybody could have the perfect setup like, like you have right now. Um, mine is, isn't as pro as yours, but I'm glad to hear that tip. <laughs> yeah. I, I like Chris. It's fun to watch. Uh, I heard about it because one of my LinkedIn connections shared a video of him, like, like scraping the, um, the head of his mic with, with like sandpaper and stuff. And you heard it one or two sl swipes. And then after that, it just went totally silent. Um, yeah. I, oh, I so love cool. anything that can make uh, a noisy environment sound real good. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. Um, so getting back to LinkedIn, are there any other big, big tips that you want to share or um, things that you that are coming up besides your podcast, any events that you're going to be part of that we can we can make sure we tune into? Ooh, uh, I would point you towards one of the seven events that I was speaking at that got canceled this year. Uh, that's, that's super unfortunate, but I do have well, a, book the, <laughs> you have a book coming. Yeah, I do. I have a book coming out in um, I, I'm on the last like 40 pages. So hopefully, you know, it won't take another like year. I've been promising this thing for a year, uh, but hopefully in another two, three months, I've, I've got a book coming out all about LinkedIn ads. So that in concert with the podcast, I think will be uh, my seminal uh, giving to the world of all of my knowledge. And then people won't need me anymore. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Well, if anybody's looking for a LinkedIn expert, if you're writing an article, um, I, I, turn to AJ all the time as my expert source for some of my search engine journal articles. So definitely um, follow him, tune into his podcast. Um, 
I'm going to take like a little bit of a, a diversion. Um, so we have like an encore part, which is called Digital Detox Secrets. So I don't know if I sent you the book or not, but I will if I didn't. So Ooh. it was, um, it came out in October. And right now, ironically, we're being forced into a digital detox because of what's happening in the world, right? We're using digital to our advantage, but we're also being like taken out of, um, you know, a lot of things that we're normally doing. So do you have any tips that you do just to kind of stay balanced? And we're, we live in this social media 24 seven world, both of us, because our professions are related to, to, um, to social and tied to social. What do you do to stay balanced having four kids and going through what we're going through? Man, I'm probably the wrong one to ask about balance. I'm just a, you know, just keep chasing, chasing, chasing until I fall down and pass out. Um, but one thing I've found is I, I can give my full energy to LinkedIn as a channel, um, but it also means I'm going to ignore the other channels that I should be doing things in. It means my Twitter is not going to get as much action, Facebook for sure. I'm not going to be able to answer as many questions on Quora as I want to, uh, but that's just what I've chosen to do. I, I've chosen my one channel and I choose one major um, thing I want to get done each day uh, or each period of the day. And that helps me focus long enough to make sure things are actually getting done so that I can unplug it, you know, five, six, seven, whatever it is until work's done. But then I can go and give the rest of my attention to my family. So kind of along the lines of, did you read that book, The One Thing, where it focuses on, you know, the one thing that you get done each day, and that's the most important thing, which before I read that book, I would find myself like, oh, let me finish these five little things before I can focus on my one thing, because then I won't be able to focus on my one thing. You know, yes. <laughs> sometimes I still fall into that trap. But yeah, you know, those are along the lines of, you know, anything else that you do just to, um, you know, kind of keep your sanity if you're, I'm assuming you're working from home now. With, yeah. With, yeah, everything that's going on. So any work from home tips that you're finding that work for you that you want to share? Oh, uh, for me, a treadmill desk has done wonders. Um, I started working from home as soon as I started the company about five years ago. And I, I pretty fast got onto a treadmill desk where you know, I'm walking at three miles an hour all day long. And I don't want to deviate and do other things. My brain doesn't want to wander. It's okay focusing just on the task ahead of me because my body is is fully engaged. Doing something else. Constant movement. Yeah. Yeah. And it's so much better than a standing desk because standing, like even during this interview, you'll see me kind of like shifting my weight as I'm, you know, letting muscles get, get relaxed. But when you're in a walking motion, you, your muscles are, uh, it's a really natural motion that your muscles never get tired of. Right. Right. Yeah. So, um, I actually used to have a, um, a treadmill desk for like two years and I had to get rid of it because I moved my office and I didn't have the space for it, but I, that, I mean, I, lost like 10 pounds the first like six months because I just was constantly, um, you know, moving, which is so, so great. And now what I do, because I don't have a stand-up desk or, or um, a treadmill desk, is I try to walk a little bit in the morning, walk a little bit at, around noon, then walk at the end of the day. So I'm not just constantly sitting. Um, but thank you for those tips. I really appreciate it. And I'm sure everybody else does too. So AJ, unless there's anything else that you can think of that you didn't share with us that you think is um, something that you want to get out there, I really appreciate your time. No, thanks. You've been super kind at promoting the stuff I'm doing. I, I appreciate it. I'm just so glad I could uh, share my value and anything I know with you guys. Well, as soon as the book draft comes out, send it to me. I will be sure to do a write-up on it and share it with my audience and do some of the top takeaways for my search engine journal article that comes out once a month. It might be twice a month now, now that things are the way they are. So we'll see. Oh, that would be wonderful. Thanks so much. All right, AJ. Thank you so much. Have a great rest of the day. Be well and namaste. See ya. Thank you for listening to this episode of Social PR Secrets. If you like what you heard, check out the book on Amazon or follow our blog at socialprsecrets.com. This episode was sponsored by The Buyer Group, a social PR agency striving to keep our balance in the digital world, practicing public relations, social media, and search marketing, while occasionally drinking a glass of wine or two for the best creativity and results. Thank you all for tuning in. If you would like to get a free chapter of Social PR Secrets, go to socialprsecrets.com slash free.